we're going to continue our, our notes on Module 5 today. Uh, last time we were talking about the, the very first ever presidential administration with President Washington's administration as well as his cabinet members like Hamilton and Jefferson and all the political differences that they had and how, how it led to the two-party system. Um, talked about the Whiskey Rebellion and how it showed the federal government had some strength. And today we're going to continue on with uh, a significant part of Washington's administration and the beginning of John Adams' administration as well. And we're really going to involve, uh, see how the United States gets involved in foreign affairs. So uh, that, that's actually the title of our lesson is Tackling Foreign Affairs. So let's, uh, let's get right into it. Okay, so um, as we know, there's a lot of things going on in Europe. We, we, we've been talking about um, how, how the French have been wanting us to be on their side and, and many of the people in France want to overthrow the, the King of England, or I'm sorry, the, the King of France. And, um, you know, for the, for the most part, most Americans initially supported the French Revolution because it's inspired by the idea of re republicanism, uh, you know, rule by the people, democracy. But, you know, and, you know, a lot of us were already heartened to our own struggle against a royal tyrant and the King, King George III. But, you know, and the French are trying to set out and create their own government based on the will of the people. Plus, we had allied ourselves to them with our Treaty of 1778 in our own American Revolution. So one of the issues that was facing America when it came to foreign affairs was whether or not the United States should support the French Revolution, and and you know, or whether we we should not. Okay, so that's 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 some some of the things we have going on. So some reaction to this, you know, despite despite the bonds that we forged over our in our own American Revolution, a lot of people still were not on the same side. So, um, uh, you know, King Louis the Sixteenth was the monarch of France who, who the, the people of France were looking to overthrow, and ultimately they do when they behead him. They, they remove his head from his body, which um, launches what's known as the Reign of Terror uh, against against any opponent who, who wishes to go against, the, the really, the rebellion that takes place in France. Um, and, and it was kind of a mobocracy. People ruled, the people were in charge, but they ruled through a mob. Um, you know, they even created their own weapon of efficient way of cutting someone's head off in the guillotine. So, um, you know, because of our, you know, so you can see it was a very volatile time in France, especially if you were King Louis the Sixteenth or his wife, Marie Antoinette. So, you know, because of our alliance with, the, or France's alliance with the United States, the French expected our help. So, American reaction was split, as you would imagine, along our party lines with our Federalists, and you know, with Alexander Hamilton, and the, you know those that favored the French were the Democratic Republicans on Thomas Jefferson's side. Uh, ultimately, Washington is caught directly in the middle, and he he sides with neutrality. He he you know he ultimately and, and Hamilton and Jefferson ultimately agree with with President Washington that entering a war was not in our new nation's best interest. We were, you know, wildly in debt. We could barely take care of ourselves. There was no need to get involved in a war 3,000 miles away. Enter this man. This is, this is a man named Edmond, Edmond Genet. He's a, he's a Frenchman, okay? And the French had sent Edmond Genet, who was a diplomat, to win support from America for France, all right? So he's there to, to try to rally support for France in America amongst Americans. Before following diplomatic procedure and getting his credentials all in order with Washington, he began to recruit Americans to fight for the French army against the British. Now this is a violation of American neutrality, and President Washington was very upset for it. And he demanded that the French recall Edmund Genet, that he be sent back to France. But by then, his political backers had fallen from power in France, like the people who sent him were overthrown. 
And so he, if he returned, he may also be imprisoned or have his head cut off too. So he ultimately stays in the United States and becomes an American citizen. Um, you know, Federalists called, called this a pretty radical move. Um, you know, the, the, how, how, how dare the French treat us this way? And, you know, Jefferson was, you know, he supported, he supported Genet and, and wanted to give him asylum. So, um, ultimately these, these things really upset, uh, and caused a great rift in Washington's cabinet and, and Hamilton, um, you know, Je Jefferson ultimately resigns from his job as Secretary of State in the year 1793, over over this really the scandal this this that happened with uh, I have citizen in quotation marks because he does become an American citizen, uh, Edmond Genet. All right, so now more foreign affairs. France and England are not the only countries that are watching America with close eyes. Uh, as we American citizens are, you know, we have our eyes on land that west of the Appalachian Mountains since it now belongs to us as a result of the uh, Treaty of uh, Paris, which ended, you know, the American Revolution. And we also want to keep our shipping rights on the Mississippi River. But to do this, we had to come to an agreement with Spain because Spain still held a significant portion of territory in Florida and a significant portion of territory west of the Mississippi River. Now, negotiations had stalled with, with Spain because of all the fighting that had been going on in Europe. But, you know, Spain had feared that the British would retaliate against them, and so they wanted to try to find an ally in the Americans against the British if, if the British did indeed try to make a move in their territory in, in North America. And so Thomas Pinckney... In 1795, is you know he, he negotiates an agreement with with the, with the Spanish, which allows Americans to have open tra open use of the Mississippi River, which is you know this border here between the Spanish territory, all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico, where it empties into New Orleans. Okay, so Americans are going to have access to the Mississippi River. And also, they're going to be allowed to have warehouse rights and access to the port of New Orleans, which all was Spanish territory uh, at this time. So Pinckney's treaty was was a good thing for the United States, and it was in, influential in in leading to our use and our, in our increasing our our, our merchant ability to, to 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 transport goods and and services across vast distances because of our access along the Mississippi River. Okay, but there's also some problems that we're having along the home front with Native Americans, as, of course, they are going to resist this continued expansion westward by white settlers. And these pioneers that kept moving further and further west across the Appalachian Mountains, um, you know, they're encroaching in on Indian territory. Uh, in places like present-day Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, Wisconsin, and uh, these people who are moving here are kind of in violation of a treaty uh, with the British because what the British had been, they, after the American Revolution, they still had several forts that they maintained in this Northwest Territory, uh, in this blackened out area, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, Wisconsin. And this is part of Minnesota right here. Um, and the British still had several uh, forts located in this territory, which is a violation of the uh, you know, Treaty of Paris of 1783 that ended the American Revolution. Well, um, you know, in addition to this continued British presence, the settlers here faced a lot of resistance from its original inhabitants, the Native Americans. So needless to say, this area is going to be a hotbed for some violence to come in the future. Um, when it came to the Treaty of Paris, Native Americans were never even considered uh, in this in the, in the provisions of that treaty. So, and they continued to claim their tribal lands, and they wanted to, uh, you know, continue to to live there. And the British people who were still residing here wanted them to do that. In fact, they 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 armed them and they you know instigated them to go and to to cause problems with the the white frontier settlers that are coming 
moving westward across the Appalachia into this Northwest Territory. So when when white settlers moved into this territory, it was not an uncommon thing for Native Americans to attack them. To gain control over this area, which would eventually have become Ohio, the federal government um, they wanted to set a, send a message that this would not be allowed, and so. Um, one of the, the Native American groups that was there were, was called the Miami Nation, and their chief was a man by the name of Little Turtle. Um, and so the Native Americans met the United States Army in battle uh, you know, at the Battle of Fallen Timbers. And this is where you know, federal troops uh, were, were basically sent in against the Native Americans. Um, and and um, it was a... It was a Big victory, and this victory really crushed the spirit and also crushed a lot of the, the lives uh, of the, the, the Indians, the Miami Confederacy that was there, and it stopped a lot of the resistance in Ohio. But um, this, following this battle, the Miami Confederacy signs what's known as the, the Treaty of Greenville, which agrees to give up a significant portion of Ohio, most of Ohio actually, in exchange for twenty thousand dollars worth of goods and and stuff, you know, meaningless trinkets, plus about ten thousand dollars annually, if, if these people would evacuate this area of Ohio. So they just they had to move on. They had to move on. Um, in the Northwest Territory, with the hand, you know, with using violence is becoming, you know, new sources is having new sources of conflict. And the British are all the all the while instigating it, you know, they're, they're gi giving arms and ammunition to the Indians to to resist the the American settlers there. So the British are doing everything they can to make it difficult for for Americans. Um, it's not, and it's not because they're you know they're in self righteousness wanting to help a you know, downtrodden people, which they were. They, they there's no doubt about that. But um, eventually, this is going to lead to some more conflict with uh, between the United States and Great Britain. So in order to try to avoid some of this conflict with Great Britain, we, we send, after the, after the Battle of Fallen Timbers, we send a delegate named John Jay. He was our Chief Justice of the Supreme Court at this time. Uh, we sent him to London to negotiate a treaty with Great Britain. And one of the disputed issues was the way in which we will control territory west of the Appalachian Mountains. So the British agreed to evacuate their posts in the Northwest Territory, and the treaty managed to pass in the Senate, but many Americans, especially Western settlers, were angry at its terms because it allowed the British to continue their fur trade in that, in that area. So there's still going to be a significant British presence in the Northwest Territory in the United States. So a lot of people also did not like the idea of John Jay doing this treaty because it made us seem as though we are siding with the British over the French. So it seemed like almost to be a violation of Washington's neutrality. So once again, you see more criticism coming from the, the political parties, all politically motivated. Um, and this bitter fight over Jay's treaty you know, had le led to the growing division between Federalists and the Democratic Republicans, and it even made President Washington not want to seek a third term in office. So, you know, even in his farewell address, he, he says, he tells us to steer clear of these permanent alliances and warns us of the, the dangers of having political parties, but they are, to this day, still a major part of, of the American political system. So, so Washington chooses to not run again. He serves two terms and sets, down, sets steps down, which sets a precedent of presidents only serving two terms. So, in the election of 1796... Americans faced a new situation. We have a contest between political parties. The Federalists nominated Vice President John Adams and the um, you know, John Adams for president and Thomas Pinckney for vice president, while the Democratic Republicans chose Thomas Jefferson for president and Aaron Burr for vice president. It was a very close election, as you can see. Uh, Adams ekes out a victory by a mere three electoral college votes. Um, so, um, the, you know, it definitely is some foreshadowing here when you have such a close election. Uh, it, 
underscores the growing danger of sectionalism, which is placing the interests over a region as opposed to the nation as a whole. Now, this this, this shift that it happens during this time uh, is only temporary because after oh about 1816, 1820, we begin to see a nationalist movement. But sectionalism was definitely growing in the the, the later part of the 1700s with. And it is definitely shown in this election. So, so John Adams is president of the United States, and he is put into a position where he has to try to avoid uh, a looming war with either Britain or France. Um, France was probably France was probably the most likely candidate for for, for war, as um, a, a military tyrant had taken over by the name of Napoleon Bonaparte, and um, you know, the, the, the French were also a little upset by Jay's treaty, seeing it as a violation of, of the treaty that we had made with them in 1778. And so John Adams decides that he wants to send a delegation to have a discussion with some, some of the French leaders, including the Prime Minister, Charles Talleyrand. Now, this, he sends a delegation that consists of uh, Charles Pinckney, he's our minister to France, the future Chief Justice of the United States, John Marshall, and Elbridge Gerry. Uh, he, was, he was one of the men that signed the Declaration of Independence. So he sends them to Paris to negotiate a solution. So the American delegation planned to meet with the French Prime Minister, Charles Talleyrand, and when they get there, they are met by three low-level officials who don't ever give their name, but basically let let uh, Pinckney and John Marshall and Elbridge Gerry know that if they want to see Charles Talleyrand, they must pay $250,000 uh, just, to, just to have words with him. Well, as you would might imagine, this is, called, this is like bribery, this is, and this is not the way di diplomacy is done. And so when these, these guys just go home, because not only are they not going to pay a quarter million dollars for a conversation, they have no authority to do so. They're just diplomats. So when news of this insult reaches the United States, it becomes known as the XYZ Affair. XYZ Affair, because we don't know who those guys, those, those three delegates that met us are, and so they were labeled as Delegate X, Delegate Y, and Delegate, Delegate Z. So, uh, you know, a war cry really sweeps through the United States of millions for defense, but not one cent for tribute, which is what they wanted to pay to see Charles Talleyrand. Um, you know, so the mood amongst the United States citizenry was very anti-French, so much so that you begin to see things like people stopping to listen to French music, uh, importing French things like wines and things of that nature. Um, so this anti-French feeling continued for quite some time. And it continued to flourish, and many Federalists believed that French agents were everywhere. They, they were secret agents, and they were spies, and they were plotting to overthrow our government as they were arriving from, from France overnight. Uh, and so they were held in a particular amount of suspicion. People looked at them warily. Uh, many of them actually were vocal critics of John Adams and his, you know, you know, his administration. So because of this... John Adams and the Federalist-led government saw this as a growing threat, that this, this uh, massive amount of French immigration and the fact that they were speaking out against their administration for, for, for thinking of war with France. So to counter this, what they saw as a big threat, Congress in 1798 passes what is known as the Alien and Sedition Acts. It's, it's not just two acts. It's, it's a series of several measures, the first of which is the Alien Act, which raised the residency requirement for American citizenship from five years to 14 years. So if you moved from a foreign country to the United States, you had to live here for 14 years before you could become a citizen. And they, they raised it like nine years because it previously it was five and during that time, the president could deport you if you were considered to be undesirable. So that not not the most fair fair set of uh, lit, uh, legislation. The other another act that was a part of this was called the Sedition Act. 
the Sedition Act. What this does is it set fines and jail terms of anyone who is trying to hinder the operation of government by expressing malicious or false or scandalous statements against the government. So basically, if you just spoke out against the Adams administration, you could be prosecuted and jailed. So as you might imagine, with two political parties, and one political party being the Federalists who were in charge, which people do you think were being locked up most frequently? Well, if you're saying it's Jeffersonians, you know, Democratic Republicans, you would be right, because they were they were out they were locked up left and right, especially the editors of Democratic Republican newspapers, even Democratic Republican politicians were locked up. So obviously these outraged Democratic Republicans called this a violation of their free speech, which was guaranteed under the First Amendment. And if you ask me, I think they're right. So uh, James Madison and Thomas Jefferson set to work to try to right these wrongs. And they decided to organize opposition to the Alien Sedition Act by drawing up some resolutions called the Virginia and Kentucky Resolutions, which were aimed at nullification. Right? What their argument was is what this, was that the states, individual states, had the right to nullify or consider void any act of Congress that they think went against the Constitution. Uh, Virginia and Kentucky were two states that did this, and they argued that you know the, the Alien and Sedition Acts were unconstitutional violations of an American's First Amendment right to freedom of expression. So these resolutions also called for the states to adopt similar declarations. No other state did so, only Virginia and Kentucky. But nevertheless, these, these resolutions showed that the balance of power between the state and federal government remained a controversial issue, which who was going to reign supreme? Who's going to have more authority? Is it going to be the federal government or is it going to be the states? So this is a, a battle that you're going to see for quite some time in balancing the power between, the, you know, in federalism, the, the division of power between state and federal government. And finally, in the year seven, throughout the year 1799, George Washington was active in, in American life. Uh, he wrote letters. He recruited possible generals, made plans for the army. But in December of 1799, he, he dies after catching a very bad cold, yeah, as he was an elderly man, uh, where he was, and then he was buried, according to his wishes, at Mount Vernon, which is just outside the, the city of Washington, in, in, in Mount Vernon. This is his home site. Um, ironically, his death was instrumental in improving relations with France because Napoleon, for the first at the at the at this time first consul of France, not quite emperor yet, he hoped to allure American friendship away from the British, and ordered French armies to observe ten days of mourning for President Washington after his death. So soon, this this kind of little foreshadowing. So this. That's a nice concession that that Napoleon makes, but pretty soon he's willing to give away, you know, several hundred thousand acres of land for pennies on the acre, and that's something that we're going to look at during the administration of the third president of the United States, and that is Thomas Jefferson. So, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of things happening early in our in, the, in American history, especially with the first couple of administrations. We see some t our Constitution being put to the test with the Alien and Sedition Acts, and ultimately we'll find out what happens with those. Because in case you didn't know, they're not on the books anymore because the third president of the United States has a little something to say about that with Thomas Jefferson. We're going to look at him in lesson three. So if you have any questions or if there's anything I can do for you about your notes today, don't hesitate to contact me through Schoology, email, call the school, whatever you need. Um, I've changed rooms, so when you come back to school on Monday, I'll be in Mr. McLean's old room. It's room 39. Uh, it's beside Miss Jennings and across from Dr. Wood. So it's in the science wing, so it's a lot larger room. We'll I got, you know, well, you'll have the same seats, but if you can't remember where you said I have the seating chart, it's not a big deal. But uh, make sure you come here, and I'll, my other door will be locked, so you, you'll figure it out. Um, if there's anything I can do for you, don't hesitate to, to ask. And um, tomorrow you'll have your, your Friday assignment. Make sure you get it done by the end of the day tomorrow. And uh, I hope you guys are doing well and taking care of yourselves. And I look forward to seeing you next week. So have, have a good one.